Good evening. Okay, we are going to start in about five minutes. So um, if everybody can start taking the seats, that would be great. So we can start on time. Uh, we have a very exciting agenda, which I'm sure everybody would enjoy. So um, if I can have everybody's attention. Kip. All right, I'm just trying to get attention of the people who I know. Ron. So um, we will be starting in about another four minutes. So, so please um, take whatever uh, you would like to eat and then have seats over here. Okay, we're going to start in two minutes. There are plenty of seats over here um, in the front. One more minute. If everyone can start moving towards the seats and take a chair, that would be great. Thank you. And I would also like to remind the, the FETP residents and the, who are basically presenting today to take the seats up front. And then um, also the poster presenters as well, please. Get started. Um, it's 
almost 6.30, it's actually 6.29 on our watch, so we're going to start on time. Um, well, good evening, everyone. I am Kashif Ajaz, and I'm the Principal Deputy Director for the Division of Global Health Protection in the Center for Global Health as Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. It is my pleasure and an honor uh, to welcome you to the 68th Annual Epidemic Intelligence Service Conference, and then also to the 19th Field Epidemiology Training International Nights, because we actually had two nights. Um, yesterday was posters, and today is the oral presentation session. Um, you know, and tonight I would also like to acknowledge uh, many of our partners, uh, both from WHO as well as our global partners at the Ministries of Health, who are actually in audience as well, uh, and, um, and, and other organizations around the globe. I would like to thank um, all of you to, for joining us and ask that you stand and be recognized. Um, all our international partners were actually here, which includes the FETPs as well. Um, so if you would just, you know, get recognized and stand up and, and take. <clears throat> so actually, all of them are actually international. So, so that's why they're not standing up. Um, so every year, um, the number of abstracts and the quality keeps on getting better and better, which makes our life uh, a little difficult and increasingly difficult to select the best at, to present at this forum. I want to congratulate all the trainees, uh, resident advisors, and mentors for their hard work. So if you haven't seen the poster exhibit or the photo exhibit, I encourage you to take time to see it. I'd also like to mention that many of the FETP outbreak investigations and photos are highlighted in the Division of Global Health Protection's updates from the field. Uh, the most recent issue is, is um, you know, available at our website and is being shared uh, with our external partners and policymakers. The most important thing that I also want to tell everyone is that the FETP International Night is co-sponsored uh, by by CDC, but our longstanding partners, which is the Training Programs in Epidemiology and Public Health Interventions Network, or TEFINET. So I, I really want to thank for them for their collaboration and long, longstanding work that they have actually been able to do with all the FETPs around the globe, as well as the, the regional networks around the globe as well. So with that note, I would actually like to also let everyone know that this is the first time that we are missing one of our um, beloved colleagues and dear colleagues, uh, which is no longer among us. So last year, we lost um, Dr. Um, Herrera, Dr. Denise Herrera Guibert, who was the director of the TEFINET. Dr. Herrera, or Dio, as many of you used to call, uh, call him, had an amazing presence and an unforgettable smile, which you can actually see from this picture. During his leadership, he worked tirelessly for over the past nine years to build a strong network of FETPs in over 100 countries. Dr. Herrera and was the driving force behind the planning and implementation of these international nights. We honor his life and legacy, and we are forever grateful to him for his commitment to working collaboratively with us to build core capacities in disease surveillance and response and improve global health security. So let's recognize Dr. Herrera. I'm sure he's actually smiling at us even now. So please, let's just give him a round of applause. So now a little bit about the import importance of these international nights and our commitment to working with the partners to build, uh, build, build uh, this network. And FETP International Nights have become one of the highlights of the EIS conference and provide an excellent platform for FETP trainees and graduates to engage in thought-provoking scientific discussions as well as strengthening relationships with EIS colleagues who can be called upon on a daily basis and especially during public health threats and crises like we have seen recently in Ebola crisis at both in DRC as well as the Ebola epidemic response. Um, our, as our division director, Dr. Nancy Knight, who is not here today tonight because she is actually on um, in, in a travel status, uh, she has she had noted in her message in in the program book 
This year's theme is Strengthening Partnerships and Improving Global Health Security Through Field Epidemiology Training Surveillance and Outbreak Response, which embodies the work that CDC uh, does. Uh, and, and then uh, our division is actually, uh, you know, the, the Division of Global Health Protection is very much engaged in that commitment as well, along with our uh, other centers as, and, um, you, know, uh, you know, offices around CDC. And, and our commitment is to help countries build capacities to quickly contain threats and improve public health preparedness. FETP disease detec detectives, which is all of you, are the boots on the ground. And we remain committed to supporting the development of disease detectives and working collaboratively with the ministries of health and other partners to build a cadre of well-trained epidemiologists who have the necessary skills and experience to quickly detect and effectively respond to health threats. For this session, a little bit about this session today, um, there will be six oral present presenters who are representing the field epidemiology training programs in Taiwan, Kenya, Australia, Tanzania, and, and Jordan. And they will present and um, you know, share their investigations and research um, in topics ranging from chronic diseases like hyperlipidemia, as well as communicable diseases including salmonalysis, as well as um, tuberculosis, HIV, and other and zoonotic diseases as well, like leptospirosis. I would like to note that for the first time ever, two abstracts were submitted for the International Night were also accepted for the presentation during the EIS conference on, on yesterday and earlier today. So I, I want to congratulate Dr. Said Asaf from Jordan, who presented um, on a cross-sectional study among adults with diabetes, hypertension, and dyslipidemia. And you will also hear him today as well and tonight. Um, and Dr. Aideen Marcus from Germany, who presented on rotavirus vaccine uptake. So I would like to congratulate both of them, as well as um, their, their colleagues, for being able to get recognized not only at this forum, but also in the, during the EIS conference. <clears throat> so before we get started um, on the presentations, um, uh, we are pleased to have with us Admiral um, Steve Redd, who will provide opening remarks on behalf of CDC. Uh, Rear Admiral Redd, um, you know, Dr. Redd has been the director of the CDC's Public Preparedness and Response, or actually we have changed the name of that uh, center to the C Center for Preparedness and Response, but, but he is over all of us, you know, and, and, uh, which is, and he's the deputy director for preparedness and response. And, um, you know, Dr. Red was all in, the, uh, in the past was the director of the CDC's Influenza Coordination Unit as well. Uh, he is the Rear Admiral and Assistant Surgeon General in the U.S. Public Health Service, and he's a graduate of Princeton and Emory Universities. Uh, and with that, I am actually going to invite Dr. Red. Please join in welcoming, welcoming Dr. Red to the podium. Th thank you, Kashef, and it is a pleasure to be here to welcome you to the um, the Field Epidemiology Training Program Oral Presentation Session. I think that the the importance of FETP is um, is uh, it's really hard to overstate how important it is. Um, as as you know, it's modeled on the EIS program, a um, a program that is based on learning by doing. Uh, I think this is also the way medical training in general is based. That um, Knowing something is not enough if you can't do the thing that you know. And we cannot change the world just with knowledge. It really requires that combination of knowledge and science and action. So um, I will talk a little bit about the FETP program, a little bit about what is going to happen tonight, and then um, go back to this idea of the importance of training at CDC. Um, this year, um, 2,058 uh, trainees graduated from the FETP program from 37 different countries. That is really a, a massive amount of training. Um, the, the trainees um, have responded to 342 public health emergencies and, and some really notable ones. Uh, in South Africa, the, um, the largest listeriosis outbreak that's ever been recorded was uh, 
was um, addressed by FETP graduates, over 1,000 laboratory confirmed cases and 216 deaths. Um, the ongoing Ebola outbreak in, um, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, over 120 FETP, gra FETP graduates and fellows have participated in that response. Um, and the work goes beyond just uh, emergency responses. The FETP um, trainees have participated in 122 HIV investigations from mother to child transmission, the um, co-infection with TB and HIV, um, and risk factors for inadequate viral suppression. Um, the, there have been five programs accredited by um, TEFINET, um, including um, three uh, this year, uh, Nigeria, South Africa, and Tanzania. Um, so a, lo a lot has happened in this past year. Um, tonight's session, um, you've heard that there will be six oral presentations. I want to just highlight um, Kashif's remarks that with the expansion of the um, uh, who's eligible to, uh, to submit abstracts, two abstracts were, were, have been presented this year at the, uh, at the regular session. I think that is, um, is quite a, um, a milestone in the development of the FETP program. Um, it also is a highly competitive process. 195 abstracts were, um, were submitted and only um, 29 were able to be accepted, the eight uh, for oral presentations and 21 as posters. So um, training was one of the things that uh, was at the heart of the formation of CDC and I think it has gotten a little bit not so much in the limelight compared to some of the other things that go on at CDC, um, like um, the Ebola outbreaks, the measles outbreaks this year, influenza year in and year out. But, um, but training is, um, is really a, a core mission of CDC, uh, and the FETP program is a part of that core mission. The, um, the program and the fellows contribute to CDC and to the world's health in two, in two ways. The first is the kind of things that you hear tonight, the, um, the um, investigations and the work that the, the trainees, the fellows do during their training. But I think what is even more important is the work that, um, that will be accomplished in the future. And, and that's really what training is about is uh, preparing the skills to be to be the future leaders in, in global public health. So um, I'm looking forward to a great program, um, and it's great to see everybody out here. Thanks. Thank you, Admiral Red. Thank you, Dr. Jaz, as well. Um, good evening. I'm uh, Dr. Patrick O'Carroll. I'm the acting director of TEFINET. Um, it's my privilege now to introduce the two people who will moderate uh, the scientific presentations which are about here tonight. So let me invite uh, Professor Mafuta Chimanga and Dr. Rebecca Bunnell to, to come to the table. Um, and as they do, before we applaud, before we applaud, thank you, uh, I'm going to tell you all about how wonderful they are in a moment because they are remarkable people. But uh, before I even do that, I just want to reflect on the fact that you've just heard a welcome from two of the most senior people, senior leaders at the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And it, it reminds me to, to, to remind you that in addition to providing decades of financial underpinnings for the, for the global system of field epidemiology training programs, and they are not the only funders anymore, but they are still by far and away the lead funders of this. They are also uh, dedicated professionals who have worked and helped design and helped create and be innovative and partner and create relationships with people all over the world and with many of you in this room, perhaps all of you in this room. Uh, and it really speaks to one of the most remarkable and long-standing investments that CDC has made over these decades. And so I'd like to pause for a moment and give CDC a hand for all of the support that it's done over the years. Now, if I could get my presenters, my, my uh, moderators up to the table. Please join us. Please. Let me first introduce, uh, on my immediate left, uh, Professor Mafuta Chimanga. 
Uh, Dr. Dr. Professor Chimanga is the director of the Zimbabwe Field Epidemiology Training Program, which was established in 1993, which is a long time ago, with a vision to help the Zimbabwe Ministry of Health create permanent capacity to train and use public health practitioners to sustain that country's public health infrastructure and improve health service delivery. The Zimbabwe FETP has trained well over 200 graduates to date for that country, and under Professor Shimanga's leadership, the program has become a true model of successful collaboration among multiple partners there, including the University of Zimbabwe, the Ministry of Health and Child Welfare, CDC, AFINET, and others. That alone would be a remarkable uh, achievement. But add to it that Professor Chimanga is also chair of the board of directors of the African Field Epidemiology Network, which is one of the strongest regional support networks for FETPs anywhere in the world. And in addition to that, is also a, an honored member of the TEFINET Advisory Board and a longtime friend of TEFINET who helped found our network. So it's our privilege tonight for Professor Chimanga to be one of our moderators. Our second moderator, well, <laughs> right, applause. Our second and equally distinguished moderator is Dr. Rebecca Bunnell, who directs the Office of Science at CDC. Now, the Office of Science provides CDC overall with scientific vision and leadership in promoting the quality of CDC science, and also helps to encourage the application of science to solving important and ever-changing public health problems. Dr. Bunnell joined CDC in 1996 as an EIS officer, which makes me feel really old, so I joined as an EIS officer in 1985. Um, she joined as an officer in the Division of STD Prevention. She has held key CDC positions in Atlanta, California, Uganda, and Kenya, and spent 14 years stationed in East Africa. Most recently, Dr. Bunnell served as the Deputy Director for Science, Policy, and Communications in the Division of Global Health Protection. And prior to coming to CDC, if we, again, just stop right there, it would be an amazing beta, but prior to that, she worked with the UK Medical Research Council, the AIDS Support Organization, Action Aid Uganda, and Médecins Sans Frontières. So an amazing uh, set of achievements and, and positions held over the years of leadership, and it's our honor to have her as our second moderator. Please join me in giving her applause. Dr. Bundle is going to kick us off, but she has one extra thing I didn't tell you about, and that is she keeps six chickens in her backyard, <laughs> which turns out to be remarkably apt for our first scientific presentation. So, Dr. Bundle, I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> I'm sorry, Dr. Red is going to come and sit, make you go. I'd like to recognize a uh, distinguished visitor tonight. Um, we have um, Dr. Tom Frieden, uh, former director of CDC, and um, Tom, if you'd like to say a few words, I know how important this program is to you, so you can welcome to you. Thanks very much. I don't want to get you off schedule much, but I did uh, want to be here. I catch every international night I possibly can. Uh, as you've all heard me say, uh, I believe that the FETPs may well be the single most important thing CDC does in global health. And part of what is being done is to build a global community. We speak one language. That language is epidemiology, not the epidemiology of analyzing data, but the epidemiology of using data to improve health and seeing the faces and the lives behind the numbers, as Bill Fagy says so memorably. So uh, really looking forward to catching as much of this as I can. Thank you for the work that you do. Uh, just um, a non-commercial message for a moment. What I focus on now is primarily uh, uh, dealing with prevention of epidemics and prevention of cardiovascular disease and the non-communicable diseases. And what we've seen in both of those areas is an overwhelming interest in expanding the work of the epidemiology training programs and uh, public health implementation programs in those areas. So we see the FETPs as a crucial resource for that, and increasingly hope to see FETP graduates, not only already are they doing fantastic work all over the world, but that even increasing further in terms of strengthening ministries of health, subnational public health programs, and public health more generally. So it's a wonderful collaborative community, and great to be here with you this evening. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Frieden. And I do remember, Dr. Frieden, when you were our director, that you often took time out to mentor FETP uh, 
folks from around the world. So thank you for all your contributions. It's a real privilege to not only hear all of your presentations tonight, but just to be in the room with the spirit and the collective feeling of all the public health leaders from around the world. So it's one of my favorite nights of the year as well. I was, we were instructed uh, to be very strict about time and to um, request that those who have questions just ask one question, not five in one, and, and, <laughs> and briefly introduce yourselves. We know there are many very accomplished folks, but it should just be a brief introduction and one question. Um, okay, we are honored to have as our first presenter tonight, Dr. Yunnan Che. Uh, from Taiwan, and Dr. Che will be presenting on salmonellosis outbreak in a restaurant associated with French toast sandwich, Chennai County, Taiwan, 2018. Please, Dr. Good evening. On April 27, 2018, Chai County Health Authority called Taiwan CDC to report a food bomb outbreak. Of 19 people with acute diarrhea, 12 were hospitalized and one died. The decedent was 24 years old male with known underlying diseases. 13 of them were left confirmed with some later species infection. The onset dates were from April 18 to 23. All the year persons had eaten uh, same restaurant in Jai County before illness. Taiwan FETB started investigation to identify the infection source. In Taiwan, the instance of salmonellosis was estimated between 75 to 83 cases per 100,000 people from 2011 to 2015. Salmonella species was the third most common bacteria associated with foodborne outbreaks in Taiwan in the past five years. However, most contamination rules of this outbreak remain unknown. Our objectives were to identify foods associated with this outbreak to identify contamination route and to recommend preventive measures. We conduct epidemiological, laboratory, and environmental investigation. For epidemiological part, we identify possible patrons from six sources, including the strong orders for uh, patrons' contact, contact information, revelers from other patrons, emergency department treating cases for other cases of acute diarrhea, other, other hospitals for outbreak related ear persons, Institute of Forensic Medicine for the deceased person, and the local health authority for reported foodborne illness complaints. We define a case as a patron with diarrhea occurring within 72 hours after eating at a restaurant during April 16 to 27, 2018, and the control as a patron with no symptoms occurring within 72 hours after eating at a restaurant during the same period. We conduct telephone interview using a standard questionnaire to collect demographics, symptoms, and uh, con food consumption. We collect human specimens, food, and environmental samples for enteric bacteria, norovirus, and rotavirus testing. Human specimens include rectal swabs, stools, or blood from cases of food panelers. Autopsy was conducted for collecting swab specimens from organs of the diseased case. Food samples were only soy milk tea and a cell sandwich. The environmental samples included swabs from kitchen utensils, egg crates, and water. We performed fit perseveral electrophoresis, or PFGE, and whole genome sequencing, or WGS, on some of the isolates for stereotyping and genetic, genetic relatedness. We conducted work through inspection of the restaurant sanitation and the food safety practice on site. With the restaurant owner's permission, we reviewed daily installed surveillance camera recordings to observe food storage and preparation. We also interviewed food handlers on food preparation. Now, I will show you our investigation results. We recorded 202 persons from active case finding. Of these, 30 were unable to contact and 172 were interviewed. We exclude 74 persons who were not patrons. Of the 198 patrons, we further exclude six patrons because of the, the incomplete responses. Finally, we identify 47 cases including the decedent and the 44 controls in our case control study. 
The left one was only a reported respiratory symptoms. The median age of cases was 30 years old, 32 cases were male, 14 cases were hospitalized, and one case died. The median incubation period was 10.5 hours. The major symptom was diarrhea, followed by fever, abdominal pain, and vomiting. The incubation period and the major symptoms were consistent with some analysis. This epicurve shows the timing of case by onset date. Cases consumed foods on different days and had illness from April 18 to 26 with a peak on 21. The restaurant was suspended from operation by local health authority on April 27, and the Taiwan FTV started the investigation on May 1st. We analyzed 69 foods consumed by cases and controls. Here we only list the top five foods consumed mostly by cases. In cases, the odds of eating the French toast sandwich was 102.4 times higher than controls. Only the French toast sandwich was statistically significant associated with illness, and other 6A foods were not. Here shows how the restaurant prepared the French toast sandwich. Food handler first prepared egg mixture via breaking and missing raw eggs. Next, they add ingredients such as pan fried eggs and pork floss to bread to make sandwich. Then they dip the sandwiches in egg mixture. Lastly, they fry the sandwiches on a heated griddle and put a piece of hand on it, as shown in the picture on the right. However, we were not sure if the temperature of the heated griddle was high enough to keep some it up. The flint toast sandwich was not only made fresh, but also made to ready to serve. Some last basis was isolated from 16 of 17 cases. For the decedent, except for large intestine, other 13 specimens were positive for some last species, including liver, heart, and the small intestine. Among these cases, one case was also positive for novitis, and another case was also positive for bacillus cereus. Human specimens from nine food handlers, two food samples, and seven environmental samples were all negative for enteric bacteria or virus. The PFGE of all isolates were identical in the serotype as Salmonella and this. We first selected isolates for whole genome sequencing. The WGS diagram showed that isolates in this outbreak were genetically indistinguishable. The environmental had been cleaned and sorted before sampling. Therefore, walkthrough inspection could not assess less long sanitation and the food safety during outbreak. The two pictures show that the uh, clean kitchen and a tidy counter in the restaurant. We spent 70 hours to review the surveillance camera recordings and noted that eggshell dropped into a missing bowl during breaking eggshells and picked up by food handlers. We also observed that during the business hour, the missing bowl was not washed and the egg mixture was stored at room temperature for 18 hours. In top picture, when the restaurant closed, we found that a food handler was reserving leftover egg mixture as shown in the circle, uh, as shown in the red circle. When the restaurant opened again, the same handler reused the leftover Leftover egg mixture continuously reused for three days. Because some of and is usually linked to the use of raw eggs, we conduct egg trace back in the We collect 20 fresh eggs and wash eggs and open from laying for some of species testing. All the specimens were negative for some of species. The picture shows the fun environmental egg packaging and egg sampling process. In conclusion, some of the was a teleological agent in this outbreak. Eggshell drop into egg mixture during preparation may be the contamination route. Storage at room temperature for 18 hours and the use of level over egg mixture may allow some of the proliferation and the persistence. French toast sandwich coke with uh, egg mixture may be the vehicle causing infection. We note a limitation in this study. First, the French toast sandwich and the egg mixture associated with the outbreak were not available for some testing. Second, environmental samples were collected after restaurant cleaning. 
Also, the X and the Lane hands sampled for testing were different than the batch because original X were unavailable, and the Lane hands were depopulated. Next, we only recruit patrons who left their contact information, which may lead to selection bias. Finally, we conduct interview two weeks after the outbreak occurred, which may lead to recall bias. We recommend the list long that homemade egg mixture should not be used when egg mixture contamination happens during preparation, store under room temperature over two hours, and the reduce of the level over. Otherwise, they should use pasteurized liquid eggs instead of homemade egg mixture. <coughs> Normal cases associated with the outbreak was identified. We follow up and find that the restaurant was owner closed it. However, other four branches of the restaurant still open and reuse pasteurized liquid eggs instead of homemade egg mixture. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Che. I think we have time for some questions. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Hi there, Raina Tercios, EIS 2001. A beautiful presentation. It's interesting to see that an outbreak of salmonella would happen of such severity among persons who are so young. I understand that the mean age was 30 years. Can you tell us a little bit about what would account for that? Were there underlying conditions among the persons who were affected? Or could you demonstrate a dose response type of response here? type of effect here. So the, the question was about the median age of the people infected in the, and if you had detected any underlying conditions that might have led to a younger median age. Uh, no, we just recur all the uh, cases that we can find. Yeah, we didn't select any uh, mm -hmm. criteria to recur the cases. Were there underlying conditions that made these people be at a higher risk for such severe disease? No, we did, we did not to, uh, to know the underlying condition. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hi, very nice presentation. Joanna Gaines, I'm the resident advisor for the Saudi Arabia FETP. Um, I actually had more of a control question. Um, so we have seen here in the United States large outbreaks of Salmonella enteritidis specifically because it's a unique pathogen and that it can infect the ovaries of a hen. So an egg, so a hen will lay an egg that's actually internally contaminated. Mm -hmm. um, in Europe, they have policies to vaccinate laying hens for Salmonella enteritidis, and I just was wondering if um, what local policies are as far as vaccination of hens or other chickens um, in Taiwan for Salmonella enteritidis. Do you know anything about that? Uh, okay, thank you for your questions. Uh, Well, uh, in Taiwan, Council of Agriculture has established the egg tracing bag system and uh, the support for packing for bug eggs to reduce the risk of con uh, salmonella contamination. Uh, but uh, also in regularly sample eggs from poultry farm and the market for bacteria and the drug residue testing. Uh, however, uh, they don't do the regular salmonella uh, surveillance uh, in the poultry farm. Yeah, but they and uh, on the other hand, uh, according to the Taiwan FDP, uh, FDA regulation, uh, the commercial liquid air should not be test positive for salmonella. That's all we have. Great. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, Tim Doyle, CDC, South Africa. Thanks for an excellent presentation. Um, my question is more of a, a lab question rather than epi, but um, it looks like you did an excellent job with the molecular characterization of the organism. I was curious if you cross-reference that with PulseNet or other databases to see if this uh, sequence had been seen elsewhere, either in eggs or, or other food items. Maybe repeat the question one more time. So, so in terms of the, the molecular characterization of the salmonella, the, the whole genome sequencing, 
Were you able to look in PulseNet or other uh, reference databases to see if that sequence had been found elsewhere in other countries, in eggs or other foods? Uh, okay, thank you for your question. Okay. Um, uh, may I have my slide? Um, 36, thank, thank you. Okay, uh, this is our uh, WGS diagram, and uh, we only uh, to compare, because the uh, in our PFGE result, we uh, isolated the Samla endritidis SEXO010, uh, this uh, PFGE pattern, but uh, the this pattern is mainly predominant in Taiwan, so we compare uh, uh, isolated in this outbreak uh, to the pre uh, previous isolates. And we only see, but we did, didn't uh, compare the isolate to other countries. And uh, because we do this uh, whole genome sequence because we want to know if the outbreak strain is specific or not a recyc uh, recycled uh, community strain. So we do this uh, whole genome sequence. Thank you for a nice presentation, Hamid Jafri, EIS class of 92. Um, I know that you presented that you tested food handlers as well. Um, I don't think I saw a slide on the results of their uh, testing, and that would have implications as to what did you think was the pathway for contamination? Was it coming through the poultry and eggs, or was it just the way the food handlers were handling the food and the source of salmonella could be some other uh, reservoir other than, other than poultry? Uh, both of those would have different implications in terms of uh, how you would control. So, any thoughts about that? Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, because uh, we still have, I, we think that they have uh, caused con contamination uh, because we have uh, eight cases did not eat uh, French toast sandwich. So, we think the uh, food handlers may be uh, with its bad. Uh, hygiene to uh, prepare the food to cause the cause contamination. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. My name is Bao Pin Su. I'm uh, EIS 96. Uh, I'm the U Ugandan FGTP veterinary advisor. So, um, Salmonella intravitreous is actually quite a virulent um, organism and it can not only cause uh, very severe disease in humans, it can also uh, cause deaths in chickens. So I was wondering whether the source farm of the egg, whether there are any chickens die off? Uh, no. Yeah, we did not find that a uh, chicken died in the uh, egg farm. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, James Gibson, uh, formerly a uh, resident advisor, Tanzania. Um, may I ask? Uh, how long uh, did it take for you to get to the restaurant to do the environmental investigation and to look for food and so on? Okay, thank you for your question. Uh, may I have my slide or uh, 12? Thank you. Uh, well, uh, because uh, the restaurant was suspended from operation on April 27th, and we start our investigation on May 5. So we sample the environmental samples on the May 5. Yeah, okay. Thank you. They have time to clean up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Any final questions? Dr. Baggett? Kip Baggett, uh, Center for Global Health here in Atlanta. Excellent presentation. I just have a, <clears throat> a very practical comment um, or observation. You had a very nice diagram of how the sandwich was prepared. I think it, thankfully we had food or we'd all be hungry right now. <laughs> um, but you said the sandwich was made and then dipped in the egg batter and then cooked and then fried. So it strikes me that the inside of the bread never is touching the frying pan. And so that seems like a problem to me. There's part of the bed, the bread that probably has egg on it, 
that never gets cooked. Do you think that was was that part of your recommendations or consideration? Yeah, uh, with because uh, we know how they prepare the French toast and sh and uh, that exactly what we worried about. Because uh, first we uh, we are not sure the, if the temperature of the kid griddle was high enough to kill the uh, some like that. Also, when they dip the French toast in the egg mixture, they may be uh, the egg mixture may uh, go to the inside of the French. They don't uh, to touch the kid griddle. So we think it's also a, a, a risk factor to cause the somnolosis. And, and such an interesting investigation where you actually had the video surveillance. Yeah. Uh, very rarely do we have that, that tool. <laughs> uh, it's like the FBI, yeah. It's like a TV show or something, yeah. Okay, any final questions? Please join me in giving a big round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Mario. Um, it's my pleasure to be here and come moderate with you. Um, our next presentation is from Kenya. It's uh, Dr. Golicha Kabale presenting on factors associated with tuberculosis treatment interruption in the Gembe South, Meru County in Kenya. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. According to WHO, Kenya is in all the three list of high burden countries, high burden uh, TB infection, that is TB, TB HIV, and multidrug resistance TB. From the Kenya 2016 prevalence survey, TB prevalence is 426 per 100,000 population with a TB HIV co-infection rate of 28%. And the same year, 577 MDR cases were notified and treated with HIV co-infection rate of 39%. TB treatment is for a minimum period of six months. Treatment interruption refers to not taking medication as prescribed. According to WHO, interruption of TB treatment for more than two months is known as loss to follow-up. Kenya had a loss to follow-up rate of 5.3% in 2017. Interruption can lead to loss to follow-up and or drug resistance TB, which is very expensive to treat. In Kenyan TB tracking system, treatment interruption less than two months is not routinely monitored. In January 2016, as part of my training competency, I did TB surveillance data analysis for Eastern Region where Meru County had the highest rate of loss to follow-up in TB HIV co-infected patients. According to the National TB Program report, Mary County is also among the top 10 counties that contributed to half of TB cases and deaths in Kenya between 2012 and 2016. In 2017, Mary County had lost a follow-up rate of 5.6% with the highest burden in Igembe South. Therefore, we felt it is important to identify risk factors for TB treatment interruption since this can help in strengthening adherence to medication and prevent loss to follow-up. The study objective was to determine proportion of TB patients who interrupted treatment and to identify factors associated with TB treatment interruption. Kenya is a country in the African continent with a population of about 53 million. Meru is a county in the eastern part of Kenya, and Igembe South is a sub-county in Meru with a population of approximately 135,000 with main occupation as agricultural activities. Igembe South has 12 TB treatment sites and three diagnostic sites. The leading cause of morbidity and mortality is upper respiratory tract infections, arthritis and joint pains, intestinal worms, and skin diseases. The study was conducted among TB patients who are on TB treatment between January 2015 and December 2016. We reviewed both hard copy and electronic registers and patient medical records. Variables collected from the register are demographics, HIV status, type of TB and diagnosis. We then conducted an unmatched case control study of ratio one to one. A case was defined as at least an episode of failure to adhere to prescribed medication for two consecutive days or more among patients on treatment in 2015, 2016. And a control was defined as adherence to prescribed medication among patients on treatment in 2015 2016. 
Cases and controls were identified from the registers where all cases were enrolled and controls selected using systematic random sampling where every ninth person on the list was enrolled. Diseased cases and controls or ones that could not be traced were replaced by the next participant on the list. Participants were traced by community health volunteers at household level where data was collected using structured questionnaire. For minors, consent was obtained from legal guardians. The variables collected were demographics, patient and facility related factors. Logistic regression was done where we calculated proportions, odds ratio and adjusted odds ratio, 95% confidence interval and p-value. In factors with p-value less than 0.2 at bivariate level were considered for logistic regression and factors with p-value less than 0.05 at multivariate were considered statistically significant. And AP Info 7 was used to, an to analyze the data. Of the 1,461 patients who were enrolled for TB treatment in 2015, 2016, 180, that is 12%, interrupted their treatment. Of the 180 patients who interrupted treatment, 10 patients were lost to follow up, 17 had died, so we enrolled 153 participants as cases for case control study. The table compares characteristics of all patients enrolled on TB treatment and those who interrupted treatment. All characteristics were almost similar except on HIV status, where HIV positivity was high among those who interrupted TB treatment. The graph shows distribution of cases and control by age group. There is a similar pattern of distribution of cases and controls with higher numbers in the age group of 20 to 39. These are bivariate factors with p-value less than 0.2 that were subjected to multivariate. The factors were occupation, household monthly income, the cost of transport to and from the health facility, cost bearer of the financial expense incurred in relation to treatment, waiting time for more than one hour at the facility, alcohol consumption, traveling out of one's locality and not, not disclosing one's TB status to family or relatives. These are the factors that were independently associated with TB treatment interruption. Waiting time of more than one hour at the health facility with an adjusted odds ratio of 3.9. Monthly income of less than 30 US dollars with an adjusted odds ratio of 2.5. Drinking alcohol, adjusted odds ratio of 2.3. Paying transport cost of more than 1.5 US dollars to and from the health facility, adjusted odds ratio of 2 and not disclosing one's TB status, adjusted odds ratio of 2.9. So a number of patients interrupted their treatment at some point. Different studies have shown different rates of interruption. For example, we had 31% in Nandi, Kenya. Interruption has been associated with several factors. Patients whose monthly household income was less than 30 US dollars and paying a transport cost of more than 1.5 US dollars to and from the health facility were likely to interrupt their treatment. According to the TB catastrophic survey done in Kenya 2017, 27% of the TB households suffered catastrophic cost. And patients who lived far from the health facilities had to pay more money to get to the health facilities. And patients who were too weak to walk to the health facilities ended up missing their medication. Patients who had to wait for more than an hour for treatment refill were five times likely to interrupt treatment. Long waiting time can discourage one from returning to the health facility for subsequent visit, or a patient stays hungry as they wait, hence discouraging revisits. And patients who drank alcohol were twice likely to interrupt treatment. From other studies, substance use like drinking alcohol has been associated with TB treatment interruption. Patients who disclosed their TB status to relatives or friends were less likely to interrupt their treatment. From other studies, disclosure enhances social or community support, which has been shown to be associated with treatment adherence and better outcome. Our study had few limitations. Interruption was based on what was documented in the registers only. The study did not find out if patients had interrupted their treatment at home. This could have underestimated the rate of interruption. The study did not also include loss to follow up patients who could be having different characteristics or not. 
In conclusion, Igembe South had a high rate of TB treatment interruption, more than twice the national average, and both health system and patient factors were associated with treatment interruption. And from various studies, whether a person interrupts treatment for a day, two days, or two months, the factors associated with treatment interruption were similar. Our recommendation to the county was to improve triage and giving waiting waivers for patients who came for refill only and provide intensive counseling and education to patients prior to initiation of TB treatment to help in adherence and control of substance use during treatment. Our recommendation to the national TB program was to consider using community health volunteers to deliver drugs to patients to supplement cost of transport. Advocate for enrollment of TB patients into existing social protection programs to supplement their income and implement routine monitoring of interruption less than two months to catch early interrupters early enough and prevent loss to follow up. Findings of our study was disseminated to both Meru County Department of Health and the National TB Program and discussion on inclusion of TB patients in social protection program is ongoing. I would like to acknowledge all institutions and individuals who contributed to my work. Thank you. Thank you for a very good presentation. Um, the floor is open for questions. Uh, maybe as people walk through, can you make a comment as to whether you looked at those with co-infection and the effect of the pill burden and side effects, whether that could have influenced interruption? Uh, no, we didn't look much, in, we, we didn't look exactly into that, we just checked for reasons, whether interrupted, what was your reasons, but mm -hmm. we were not very specific about the co-infection. Okay. Thank you so much, that was really important and really interesting. Unfortunately, you had very few persons less than age 15, and the conditions that would predispose those less than 15-year-olds may be different than the ones of over 15 years old because they may depend more on caregiver, that is their parents' behavior, than on their own initiative. That would be something that's important to, to separate. Were you able to do an analysis that excluded those younger age groups from those older age groups? No, we didn't separate them. Yeah, Hi, excellent presentations. I'm uh, Dr. Priya Khan, the resident advisor for Bangladesh FATP program. Uh, I have a question. Most of uh, your uh, cases were lost to follow up our age group, young adult age group, right? And having said that you have an electronic surveillance system, could you able to track like how many uh, lost to follow up cases are either actually transferred out and they have been initiated treatment elsewhere? Thank you. For the lost to follow up, we could not also trust them. They were just lost to follow up. But you do have an electronic surveillance system. The cases cases are being registered there. Uh, for example, someone could be registered here and they move to a different town. They don't go and register themselves as having TB or... It's not uh, exactly easy. As much as we use the community health volunteers to trust them, uh, the answer will be we cannot find this person. Probably they gave wrong uh, contacts. So tracing them is not easy. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Loud. Um, since you now have data on which of your patients are more likely to, to have treatment interruptions, um, it would be possible for you to try to predict who would be at higher risk. And is there any possibility of your moving those patients to a twice a week regimen uh, with ionization rifampin and perhaps using a community health worker to observe their taking the medicine. And I know that would be more expensive, but the cost of a treatment failure is also very expensive and it might well be uh, cost effective for you. I wonder if that's the way you could use this data. Thank you. Uh, it's. In Kenya, we're still having a discussion where on using community health volunteers 
to deliver drugs at home for those who cannot make it to the health facility so that they don't miss their drugs. Right. So uh, using dots by either a close relative or a community health volunteer attached to the person since they come from the community. Great. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Amanda Nahmida, uh, EIS class of 2017. Thank you for this excellent presentation. Uh, sorry if I have missed it, but uh, I don't recall you talking about uh, exposures variable related to the education or the level of literacy of the patients or the head of the households or the family maybe. Uh, could you comment on that, whether you have collected such variable or not, and if yes, uh, some of your results. Thank you. Thank you. We collected variables on occupation and literacy, but uh, they were not statistically Education, significant. Education, sorry. Yes, they were not significant. Thank you. Yes, Ken. TP headquarters. Uh, I'm curious to know, did the Ministry of Health take any of your suggestions and implement them? Yes, they did. There is a discussion ongoing about uh, <coughs> enrolling all TB patients uh, to existing social protection programs. Uh, for example, we have the National Health Insurance Fund. So every patient who has TB is put on this system so that they don't suffer these other costs related to health. As, as much as TB is f treatment is free, they incur other costs. And also for people who have MDR TB, they're given some monthly stipend uh, to supplement for their income, especially when they have to leave their work. Thank you. Michael O'Reilly, former advisor in Thailand. Thank you for presenting your work tonight. I was stunned when you presented the national loss to fall up rate of only 5.6%. Extraordinary. Um, to be honest, I think even if the national rate were 12%, that might be extraordinary in Kenya. But it did strike me that in the county where you were doing the study, carefully reviewing the data, you got 12.6% or so. Do you think that um, this county truly has more than double the national rate of the loss to follow up? Or do you think that perhaps the national estimate is a bit low and that your data might represent more the true picture of a loss to follow up nationally? Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, treatment interruption at the national program and through WHO is defined as, we only talk about the loss to follow up, that is missing drugs for two consecutive months. But there is no routine monitoring for people who interrupt less than that. Even if you miss uh, your drugs for one week, I will just extend your medication with an extra week. So these people who keep missing drugs in between and we don't call them lost to follow up. That is what we are talking about. But um, using that percentage and comparing it to the national average, just to give a, a picture of how people interrupt their treatment even though they are not lost to follow up. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> okay. yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. I'm curious to know, um, you looked at uh, treatment interruption. So in your findings, did you find uh, whether the, the patient who interrupted their treatment, did they just interrupt their anti-TB medication or did they also interrupt the HIV medication for those patients who were receiving both HIV and TB treatment? Thank you for the question. We were only considering TB. We were looking at TB only, not HIV and others. We just looked at TB. Thank you. Is it a possibility? Do you? Yeah. Yes, it is. Uh, it, it is a possibility to look at it, but we did not. That is not was not part of my study. Okay. The next. Good evening, um, Erica Willisy from the Impact Program here at headquarters. Um, I was curious about your discussion findings where you mentioned some issues related to the way in which things are managed at the actual treatment facility. Mm -hmm. um, I think you mentioned extremely long wait times, people being very hungry, things of that nature. Um, 
I know you had one um, recommendation for introducing um, CHVs into try to do home-related treatment, but are there things that can be done at the facility level to maximize the way in which the facility is able to handle patients and also reduce the chances that um, introducing this large number of human, extra human bodies staff will um, you know, create other issues with management and control and support? Thank you for that. The, um, most of these facilities have like it's manned by two people, and they have specific dates for TB patients. Mm -hmm. So if you all come on one day, the queue is just so long. Alternatively, people prefer to go to a bigger facilities that are so far from their homes, because the bigger facilities at least have a more number of days for their clinics instead of just one, and they have a dedicated person in that clinic. So uh, from the national program, they're considering having, like for the smaller facilities, having more number of clinic days for the TB patients, yeah. So last quick question. Thank you, Hamid Jafri. Uh, just to say that the PEPFAR program in many places is learning uh, lots to follow up, and one of the two drivers, one is informal user fees that are charged by staff at the clinic. I don't know whether that was, you looked at that. And the second is that the way they overcome that is uh, financial issues, not just uh, uh, just the travel costs and such, is that they are scripting for longer periods and whether this is being considered in Kenya or not. Sorry, I didn't get that. So one of the barriers is that in some facilities, patients are charged an informal fee before any pr processing is done for patients, and is that an issue in this county? And then secondly, one of the ways to overcome repeated travels to get medication is to provide a prescription for a longer period than, so that if, if the standard is to provide medicines for one month, they would do it for three months, or if it's for three months, they'll do it for six months. So for, for TB, it is not possible to give drugs for a longer period, like how we do it in uh, HIV, because the way the registers are, it's not, yeah, it's not possible. Like the intensive phase, you come after every two weeks, and then it changes in the continuation phase. I don't, I'm not sure no, I got you, your you, first you, question. No, it's okay. Please, it's please. okay. Thank you for your presentation. This was great. Let's give a hand. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Okay, our next presenter is Dr. Anthea Catalaris uh, from Australia, who will present tonight on her investigation and response to Australia's largest outbreak of leptospirosis in New South Wales, uh, 2018. Thank you. Thank you, and good evening. By way of introduction, Australia is a country of 25 million people and New South Wales is the most populous state. And this outbreak occurred on the north coast, um, where the red dot is, in a regional farming area. In June of 2018, a cluster of febrile illnesses was recognised among berry pickers who were presenting to their primary care doctors and the emergency department um, of the local hospital with an acute febrile illness, so presenting with fevers, headache, muscle aches, a rash, gastro symptoms. Initial tests were all negative and didn't reveal the cause, including leptospirosis serology. But eventually leptospirosis PCR was performed and was positive, and subsequently the serovar was determined to be leptospira arborea, of which rodents are the predominant animal reservoir. We conducted some initial interviews with these cases, and it was revealed that they were all from a single large berry farm in the region. They were all raspberry workers, even though the farm also grew blueberries, and many of them were backpackers on short-term work visas, recent um, migrants or resettled refugees, and so many came from a non-English speaking background. Leptospirosis is a zoonosis and a spirochete, and it has an incubation period of between two and 30 days. It presents with an acute phase, um, as I described before, that usually lasts about a week, and that's when the patient is bacteremic. 
in a small proportion of cases it then progresses to an immune phase um, where the patient can develop more severe immune mediated complications such as hepatitis, meningitis um, or hemorrhagic complications. Diagnosis is predominantly through serology with an initial screening IgM used which is then sent for confirmatory microagglutination test or MAP which is serovar specific. Uh, there's also a PCR available which is useful in that acute um, bacteremic phase although it's not widely used in Australia and they're not considered confirmed cases in our national case definition. Culture is rarely used because it's quite a fastidious organism. Transmission can occur either directly, but more commonly indirectly, from infected animal urine, getting in through cuts and abrasions on the skin, or through ingestion or through mucous membranes. And it's, um, globally, it's endemic in tropical regions, but in Australia, we usually only get sporadic cases. Uh, it's nationally notifiable in Australia, and in New South Wales, we see about 10 to 40 cases per year. So this is what, um, when we started investigating, we knew of about 40 cases um, who had this sort of pic, um, clinical picture who were berry pickers. Um, and they were going back to April. And this also shows the handful in darker green that were PCR positive. So we conducted an investigation to identify the outbreak source and risk factors for infection to help guide our prevention and control measures. We conducted a case control study of the raspberry workers on the farm. So in the raspberry teams, um, there are raspberry pickers, but also raspberry packers and supervisors, and they were all eligible for inclusion. We detected cases through a range of active and passive surveillance measures, and they had to have worked in a raspberry team during their exposure period, which all the cases we found had. Our case definitions were based on our national notifiable criteria, so confirmed cases had to have a fourfold rise in serology titer or a single high titer and were IgM positive. Probable cases were PCR positive or IgM positive, and possible cases met a clinical case definition. And cases were interviewed about their behaviours and risk factors um, on the farm during their four week exposure period. We selected the controls opportuni opportunistically on site from the current raspberry workers and they had to have worked in a raspberry team since before the outbreak was detected. We collected serology to screen for asymptomatic infection, and we asked controls about their exposures during the month of May, which was taken as a representative period during the outbreak. So what did we find? We detected 84 cases, including 50 confirmed, 19 probable, and 15 possible cases. <coughs> We think about 640 people worked as raspberry workers during this time, which gives a crude attack rate of about 11%. And clinical disease was mostly mild and there were no severe complications and deaths that we were aware of. This shows the cases with their date of onset um, by month as well. Um, and so you can see, um, and confirmed cases are in red. So you can see that the first cases occurred in mid-April with the bulk of cases occurring in June and through July, and just a handful of cases occurring in August. Uh, analysis of the case control study was as per an unmatched case control study with crude and adjusted odd ratios calculated from logistic regression using a backwards elimination strategy for the multivariable modeling. And only the confirmed and probable cases and the asymptomatic seronegative controls were included in the primary analysis. So in terms of the um, variables that were retained in the final multivariable model and so were independently associated with disease, you can see that any glove use was protective against disease, as was being employed for a longer period of time, whereas reporting seeing a rodent was a risk factor, although the numbers were low, um, and requiring an interpreter was also a risk factor. We were also interested to see what factors were still associated on crude analysis only, given that our study was likely underpowered to be able to detect evidence of some of these associations. Um, and so you can see that um, always having scratches on hands as opposed to never having scratches um, was a risk factor on crude analysis, as was having contact with mud, drinking water from the trailer in the field, and being a raspberry picker as opposed to a packer or a supervisor. And reassuringly, eating the berries was not a risk factor, nor was having contact with <laughs> irrigation water, and everyone reported washing their hands. We conducted a number of farm inspections um, with an environmental health officer, 
and it was found that the personal protective equipment worn by the workers was inconsistent and inadequate in that you can see they wore these cotton gloves here, which they usually cut the fingers off to aid picking. The drinking water supply was also examined, and examined again given the suggestion of an association on crude analysis, but no source of contamination was identified. There was also evidence of rodent activity seen around the raspberry plants, and additional rodent traps were laid. A sample of the mice that were caught were sent for testing, and three of the 12 were positive by a mat for arborea and were also PCR positive. So we think that workers were likely infected through scratches on their hands that came into contact with leptospheres from mouse urine that were in the environment, and that raspberry workers were at increased risk due to the thorns that are present on raspberry plants that aren't present on blueberry plants and from inadequate glove use. There are a number of limitations to our study in that outcomes were self-reported, and so there were a number of biases, particularly um, recall bias, social desirability bias and selection biases. For example, the association with requiring an interpreter um, I think is likely due to people who were able to speak English more readily volunteering for our control interviews, despite significant efforts to use interpreters and translate our study material. There's also a number of other questions that we haven't been able to answer. So we're not sure whether leptospirosis might be present in other wildlife on the farm because they weren't tested. We don't know the baseline prevalence of leptospirosis of rodents in Australia, so the significance of finding it in a few of the mice is unclear. And we also don't know whether any environmental uh, changes, either on the farm or in the wider environment, might have contributed to this outbreak occurring now, or whether it just represents the natural expansion of the zoonotic niche of this pathogen. We implemented multiple control measures um, along all stages of the investigation and worked with our occupational health agency in this. We particularly focused on enhanced glove use um, of these impervious gloves that you can see here. And we also helped um, aid additional rodent control measures. We also offered a prophylaxis clinic for a number of weeks in July, where we offered weekly doxycycline prophylaxis for four weeks to the at-risk workers. And 114 of the current raspberry workers took up this offer. And this was a particularly interesting part of the response, I thought. Firstly, because there is limited evidence for its um, effectiveness, but also because there are a number of ethical considerations about using it in an occupational setting, especially given that the source was unclear at the time. So in conclusion, this is the largest known outbreak of leptospirosis in Australia. I think it highlights that it, leptospirosis is an important occupational risk among raspberry workers, requiring ongoing protective measures. And I think it also shows the value of PCR in assisting early diagnosis and detection. And for this reason, we should use it in our surveillance case definitions, as is done here. Thanks very much to everyone involved in the investigation and response. Yes, Simo. Simo Williams, um, Field Epidemiology Training Program team lead. I'm interested in the time the investigation started compared to um, when the outbreak started. There seemed to have been a gap. And was it because of the lab diagnos diagnosis was unclear? Thanks. Can we go to slide nine, please, the epi curve? Um, so ex exactly right. So um, we first were alerted to, um, so the first PCR positive result occurred on the, um, in mid-June. So that's when we realized um, what the cause was. And a lot of these cases um, before that um, were diagnosed retrospectively based on um, convalescent serology. Having said that, um, earlier in May, there had been um, one of the ED doctors had noticed um, and reported that some berry pickers were presenting with fever. Um, and that was recognized and noted um, but we didn't have a cause at that stage, and it wasn't until a lot later on when we got a diagnosis and we recognised how big it was that we truly um, got investigations underway. Yes. Irina Tercios, FUTP Headquarters. Could you tell us a little bit more about the PCR diagnostics that led the PCR positivity to be part of the probable case definition versus the confirmed case definition? 
Could we go to slide 24, please? Um, so as I said, we based our outbreak case definitions on our national notifiable case definitions. And in our national notifiable case definitions, PCR positive cases are considered probable cases. Um, I think largely for historical reasons, and we are reviewing that. You, you can see here that, um, so the PCR is useful in the first seven days, um, but it, and it's not um, accredited yet by our National Laboratory Accreditation Service, but it does have a high sensitivity and specificity versus culture. Um, I know that in the US, PCR positive cases are considered confirmed cases, and I think we're gonna head in that direction. Um, thank you for a wonderful presentation, really elegant. Um, so the, uh, elsewhere, the laptop outbreaks uh, often occur after uh, rainfall and flooding. So I was wondering, you know, in the epidemic COVID, apparently there are some peaks and, uh, and valleys. I was wondering whether that's related to rainfall. And also, did you measure, I, I couldn't, I did not remember. Um, did you measure, you, you said the gloves use, what, were those people walking bare feet in the field? Or, you know, what about uh, boots? Um, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, thanks for the question. So we did also look at the other protective equipment um, worn and the workers were required to wear closed shoes, preferably gum boots. And most of them did have really good compliance in this area. Um, they were also required to wear long sleeves and pants and most of them did. So it was really just the glove use which was the issue there. And the issue I think is that you have to be quite dexterous to pick raspberries because they're, they're soft. And so that's why workers didn't want to have to cover their fingers so they could pick faster and they're paid by how much they pick. Um, so that was really the only sort of breach in protective equipment. Great, great. Yeah, could we go to slide 33, please? Um, so as you mentioned, um, leptospirosis does commonly occur um, with rainfall and after flooding, and it, um, it doesn't like drying out, it needs to stay moist. So we did look at um, rainfall in the area. What I can say is that the month of March, so um, before this, had above average rainfall, but all the other um, months had below average rainfall. We mapped the daily rainfall to the epi curve, as you can see here. This doesn't have the lag on it, but I think what we, what we concluded from this is that it wasn't that there was a significant amount of rainfall or flood um, that was you know, necessarily enough to cause this outbreak, but there was enough rain around for it to be conducive to leptospirosis, leptospirosis survival in the environment. So not causative in itself, but defi definitely contributory. George Conway, Oregon. Um, Dr. Calderas, that was a very interesting talk. I'm curious, so I usually think of rodents as urinating, especially in a farm environment, vine crops, in the duff or the understory. So people would, if they were getting scratched, presumably it'd be in the upper part of the vine. So what, what are you thinking the mechanism of the introduction of leptospira would be into their, into their body? Yeah, thanks for your question. It's something we've thought about a lot. Um, so there was evidence of rodent activity around the, the bushes in terms of rodent holes and rodent droppings, and also a dead rodent in one storage shed. The bushes are grown on trellises um, with lots of wires running crossways. Um, and the advice from our environmental health officer was that rodents could definitely run along those trellises and eat the berries on the plant. So our theory was um, that the rodents were interacting with the plants and that through the picking and getting scratched, that's where the contamination occurred. But having said that, it was also possible that it was sort of in the surrounding environment as well. Thanks. On the right. Yes, thank you for your presentation. Uh, with respect to uh, Dr. Spence Lewis, CGDF Ghana, with respect to uh, some of the matters that you raised regarding leptospiriasis, uh, you mentioned moisture. Uh, would the irrigation procedures that they used have anything to do with it? And uh, from my uh, knowledge of leptospiriasis, it's a, a disease that could come from small mammals. So were there any, was there any indication in your research of other mammals in the area that ha might have been the source of leptospiriasis? Um, thanks for your question. So in terms of irrigation water, the irrigation was supplied from some dams on site, um, and then it was drip um, irrigated into the pots that the raspberry plants were grown on. So 
the whole plants weren't necessarily sprayed. So it was quite tight irrigation. And um, that was, that didn't, we did ask about that and it didn't come out as a risk factor um, in our case control study. Um, what was your other question about, sorry? Uh, with respect to the other, ma uh, other mammals. Other yes. Yeah. Um, so um, we did a hypothesis generating um, questionnaire and we did ask an open-ended question, what animals did you see around the farm? And people listed a range of animals, not many mammals, but they did um, mention rabbits and kangaroos. And we do know that um, leptospirosis can um, live in kangaroos um, in Australia, um, although it's not this Cirovar, it's Cirovar topaz that's been detected in Australia. Um, but you're right, we didn't test any other mammals like dogs or rabbits that were on the farm. We do also know though that um, arborea is, um, like rodents are the main reservoir um, of it, and we did demonstrate the presence of arborea in the um, rodent population on the farm. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. Uh, Dmitry Pavilsky with CGH. Um, I just had a methodological question. I was just wondering um, whether you considered using multiple controls per case. You mentioned some of the issues about the statistical precision and whether you considered increasing precision by using multiple controls. Yeah, we were really limited by the number of raspberry um, workers who were um, currently there. So there's quite a high turnover. So even though about 600 had worked during the period, there were only about 250 current ones. And we did approach almost all of them. Um, and we, and we then serologically screened them. So by the time we got through all that process, this is how many we were left with. So we'd really sort of saturated our control options. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I'm Ben Ahmed, I'm a professor with the Division of Global Health Protection. Mm -hmm. uh, if I recall correctly, you said, uh, I think you said the workers who did not speak English were at higher risk of contracting the disease. Uh, could you comment on whether uh, anything um, was done in terms of uh, communication, intervention, recommendation to reach out specifically to these communities in a culturally and linguistically appropriate way? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for your question. This was a really important consideration and concern of ours throughout the outbreak. Um, we were initially relying on the farm itself to provide um, the information to the workers, but then when we recognised that this was likely an issue, um, we helped and um, developed some information material and then got it translated into the five most common languages spoken by the workers. And then also when we were up there on site, we used some local interpreters um, in person to um, firstly help with our study, but also help deliver the health messages. We were also able to use some of the workers themselves um, as translators and to help get the health message across. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. <laughs> Thank you. The next presenter is from Tanzania, uh, Dr. Irene Kokuhabwa. She's going to present linkage into care among newly diagnosed HIV-infected individuals in Jombe region of Tanzania. Irene. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. HIV continues to be a major problem globally, with an estimated 36.7 million persons living with HIV as of 2017. In Tanzania, shown here in the expanded map on the right, an estimated 1.4 million persons are living with HIV infection, with a national prevalence of 5%. To address this, in 2014, UNAID set a global target called the 90-90-90 with the purpose of eliminating HIV by 2030. The 90-90 targets state that 90% of persons living with HIV should know their status. 90% of those who know their status should be on sustained ARV. And 90% of those on ARVs should be very suppressed. The term linkage to care refers to the connection between the first and the second 90s. Various studies done in sub-Saharan Africa showed linkage rates ranges between 42 to 78 percent. In Tanzania, HIV testing and diagnosis can be done through 
either in health facilities as shown here or it can be done at a community HIV testing point as shown here. In community testing, a healthcare provider goes into the communities or villages for outreach services. This sometimes happens as part of a campaign or a special event. In October 2016, Tanzania adopted a test and treat guideline to address the global target. The guideline recommends that all persons newly diagnosed with HIV, HIV positive start on ART regardless of the stage of disease or CD4 count. However, one year after implementation, we did not know how well this was working in Tanzania. The study aimed to evaluate linkage to care and identify factors associated to linkage to care one year after the national adoption of the test and treat guideline. We also wanted to compare proportion of patients linked from health facility testing sites and from community testing sites. Our study was done in a place in, called Njombe region in the southern highlands of Tanzania. The prevalence of HIV in Njombe is more than double the national prevalence at 11.4%. The study was done in three of the six districts in Njombe region, shown here in yellow. We enrolled patients from five high volume health facilities shown within the red dots. All health facilities have onset testing and two had additional outreach testing at community sites during the study period. In addition, we enrolled patients from a non-governmental organization called Sauti. Sauti supports the Tanzanian government in mobile community HIV testing. Sauti community testing points vary and are not shown in the map. We conducted a prospective cohort study where clients were enrolled on the day they are H of the, on the day of their HIV diagnosis and followed up for 30 days. Clients were enrolled into care in the clients who were enrolled into care in the first 30 days were considered successfully linked to care, while clients who enrolled later were not considered successfully linked to care. The study was conducted from December 2017 to February 2018. We collected demographic and risk factor data at enrollment using a structured questionnaire. And estimated time to linkage using kaplan meyer methods. We calculated Cox proportional hazards using regression models to evaluate factors associated with linkage to care. In total, 382 participants were enrolled. The majority of the participants were female, 70%. The median age was 32 years with an interquartile range of 26 to 38 years. Overall, 70% of the participants linked to care. The median time to linkage was one day with an interquartile range of one to two days. Of the 382 participants, 69% tested in the facility, while 31 tested in the community. Of those testing in the facility, 68% linked to care while 74% of the persons testing the community linked to care. 36, that is that 1% of the clients who were not successfully linked were traced. Of the 36 unlinked patients, we were able to trace, uh, that we were able to trace, 83% reported not being ready to link. This graph shows the time to linkage to care by HIV testing site. The x-axis shows the time to linkage in days, and the y-axis shows the proportion, proportion linking at each time point. About half of all participants linked on the day of diagnosis. This is good news, as it is aligned with the 90-90-90 goals to, to start treatment immediately. However, linkage slowed considerably after the first day, and after two weeks, fewer people continued to link to care. Although linkage was higher overall among persons testing in the community versus facility, the difference was not statistically significant. We looked at different variables that included sex, age, marital status, education, occupation, and others. In univariable analysis, age, occupation, education, and transport costs were associated with linkage to care. 
However, in multivariant analysis, only education and transport costs remain significantly associated with linkage to care. Any education at all increased linkage by about twofold, while transport cost to the clinic in excess of 3,000 Tanzanian shillings, which is approximately 1.3 US dollars, decreased linkage. In conclusion, overall, linkage to care in Jombe was 70% which is still short of the 90% UNAIDS target. Approximately half of the patients linked within one day, although linkage was slightly higher in community versus facility testing sites, this was not significant and may be due to the more active follow-up of persons tested from at least one community testing site that was Saudi. Having primary or higher education increased linkage by twofold, while transport cost over 3,000 Tanzanian shillings to the care and treatment center reduced linkage by 60%. Our study had some limitations. Uh, being observed might have increased linkage and we were unable to trace all participants. This may have underestimated the true linkage rate. In order to improve linkage, we recommend uh, providing continuing community health education on the importance of early linkage and, initi and initiation of treatment for persons with HIV, increasing community access to HIV care through scheduled outreach services. This could be done by mapping areas with high numbers of people living with HIV that do not have CTCs close within the community and setting a schedule for providing CTC services to the people in the community, or by increasing um, CTCs by um, upgrading. We have ART distribution sites used for pregnant women in uh, Tanzania. So by upgrading these, uh, these uh, distribution sites into CTCs, this could improve accessibility to uh, uh, CTCs. And lastly, conducting active follow-up of newly diagnosed clients through phone calls or individual escorts to care and treatment center. I would like to acknowledge the following. Thank you for listening. Yes, Simo. Simo Williams, Field Epidemiology Training Program, Team Lead, Headquarters, Center for Global Health. Nice work. For the 30% that didn't link, what were their reasons? So if I understand it, I come in, I get tested, and you're telling me I have HIV and I need to start treatment right away. Mm -hmm. But I'm in denial, I'm in shock. Mm -hmm. And so I, what were some of the reasons why the others didn't link? Um, thank you for the question. So uh, for those who did not link, uh, we were able to trace We were able to trace 36 uh, clients who did not link, and 83% um, said that the reason why they were not ready, uh, they had not uh, comprehended uh, the issue about linking, so they were not ready to go to CTC. But one patient died, so we couldn't ask why. And uh, <laughs> two patients uh, were in denial. Uh, they, they said they did not have HIV. And the remaining had not found time to go to CTC, so they were, they were traveling, so they were waiting to go back to their hometowns to start uh, uh, treatment. Um, Bob Pinsu, uh, resident advisor of Ugandan FETP. Um, I really enjoyed the presentation. I also uh, realized how much work you probably have put into this. It's really remarkable. Uh, so congratulations. Thank so you. my question is, your Kaplan-Meier uh, curve showed a very clear separation of the testing sites. Um, even though the, uh, the p-value is point, um, I think point 0.1, uh, it's not significant. So I, I wouldn't dismiss it uh, right away because you have a relatively small sample size. So I, can, you, can you go back to the, to the Kaplan-Meier curve? Could you repeat the question? Uh, 
Could you go to slide 13? 13. Yeah. yeah, so it shows really a very clear separation of the curve, even though p-value unfortunately didn't read that magic number 0.05. Um, uh, so I wouldn't automatically dismiss it. It looks like there is, there is a big difference. So my question is, why was there this difference, even though it's not significant? Okay, um, thank you for the question. Well, uh, we could see the big difference because um, even though the community uh, uh, clients from the community testing point were less, uh, we had Saudi, which is an NGO that carried 65% of uh, the clients that were uh, tested within the community. And Saudi basically had uh, a different uh, mode of uh, follow up. They had an active follow up of these clients, whereby these clients were followed up and some were escorted. And basically, Saudi's main uh, uh, main job is community linkage. So they had a more active role, and that is why we see that this big difference. And um, among the 60, uh, among the, the the clients that were uh, tested at within Saudi, the Saudi network, 96% linked to care. So that shows uh, gives you the di the, di the difference. Again, yeah. very, very nice presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Claire Dykwitz, CDC, uh, DGHD, Atlanta. Thank you very much for a very interesting um, presentation. Um, I want to know, um, of those who were not ready, what was the sex distribution? Um, sorry, uh, I did not uh, distribute them by sex. Uh, so uh, I can't really answer that question. Okay, I yeah. wonder, um, I think it would be useful to unpack why they're not ready. In Ethiopia, mm -hmm. women in many rural areas have to get their husband's permission before they can be tested, before they can start ART, okay? Um, if they're not able to disclose to him because of a fear of, for example, intimate partner violence. If they can't disclose, they can't get permission, they can't start ART. Have you looked at that as a possible reason for them not being ready? Uh, yes, we looked at disclosure, uh, but it was not significant. Um, a couple other questions. Have you looked at whether or not uh, they felt... Um, so, um, <laughs> One question at a time, thank you. Yeah. Good evening, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. My name is Herman smith -Sota. I'm with Mbutu Speaks, uh, Workforce tr uh, Training and Development. The question I have is, uh, you stated early in your presentation that uh, this region has a high prevalence rate of 11% about. Yeah. What makes this region so different than the uh, other regions in the country and why is it so high? What are some of the reasons or characteristics that exists in this region that has the prevalence so high? Okay, um, thank you for the question. Uh, Jombe is the high, has the highest prevalence in Tanzania, and it's within the southern highlands of Tanzania, where we have the top three uh, regions with HIV. Uh, it's in the highlands, it's quite cold. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's the coldest place in Tanzania. Um, it's, also, it's also linked to the highway. Uh, we have, uh, because the Southern Highland is bordered by Malawi, uh -huh. Zambia, Congo. So it's, the, it's, it's within the highway. So there are a lot of trucks and um, a lot of activity. And um, most of the, the people who live there migrate. So they, they leave Njombe and then they come back when they're sick. So basically, that's why uh, it's, it's Highland. Um, there's a lot of movement mm -hmm. uh, within the borders, and um, there's a lot of migration okay. in that area. Thank you very much. This was such a great study, and it does something that um, all FETP investigations should do. You really have the chance to make a practical difference. By identifying fully 30% of folks who, after we've done all the work of identifying them as being positive, 
we're, we're failing to link them to care, you've identified people whose lives can be saved and who profound morbidity uh, can be prevented. And I just strongly encourage you to really monitor and evaluate the interventions that you put down and see, you know, after six months or a year, mm -hmm. the people who you didn't capture after the first two, two days, uh, if you can cut that rate to 15 percent, you're, you're going to save lives. You're going to do such wonderful work. So congratulations. Thank you. Uh, Kip Baggett, Center for Global Health. Um, I, my question comment was very similar to to Michael's. So um, congratulations on a very nice uh, piece of work. I think it also demonstrates the uh, importance of the close relationship that that FETP has with the PEPFAR program, and uh, the good work that can be done to address these global 90-90-90 goals, and. Um, so I guess I was going to take Michael's comment and, and maybe turn it into a question. And, and I was really thinking, what would Ambassador Burks say if she were here? She would, she would want to know about that action. And um, the, if the findings you have and the recommendations that you made, um, what plans do you have to kind of ensure that there is implementation and, and follow up? And, and do you think that that's realistic, that there will be some change, some action? Thank you. Um, I believe there's change uh, because when we did the study, it was immediately after the adoption of test and treat. So our guidelines were not in place. Uh, the, it was something new in Tanzania. So now with time and with the support of PEPFA, um, strategies have been put in place and the linkage rates have come up. Uh, the issue about um, escorts, uh, active uh, follow-up uh, is now in place. And uh, there are quite a number of interventions that are being put in place uh, to make sure that uh, we attain the 90-90-90. Yeah. So basically, it's, uh, it's, we're still in progress, but uh, there is a change from the time I did it in 2017 to now in 2019. Thank you. I hope Thank hopefully you. those things will be adopted nationally as well. Thank, Thank you. you. We've run out of time. Um, sorry. Thank you. Okay. Our next presenter, Dr. Saeed Asaf, is uh, from Jordan and will be presenting on the prevalence, awareness, control, and trends of diabetes, hypertension, and dyslipidemia among adults in Jordan, a cross-sectional study, 2018. Good evening. Uh, I am Dr. Saad Asaf. I'm a FETB graduate and uh, third year president in community medicine. Today I'm going to talk about the prevalence, awareness, control, and trend of diabetes, hypertension, and dyslipidemia among adults in Jordan 2017. The diabetes mellitus and hypertension and lipid abnormalities are the major risk factors of cardiovascular disease. With the rapid lifestyle changes and socioeconomic development, the prevalence of NCDs has markedly increased over the past years in Jordan. Non-communicable diseases are considered are considered the leading cause of death in Jordan, with 38% of deaths attributed to cardiovascular disease. The main objective of my study to determine the prevalence, awareness, and control rates of diabetes, hypertension, and dyslipidemia among Jordanian adults. Four comprehensive population-based surveys of risk factors of cardiovascular disease were conducting in Jordan during the years 1994, 2003, 2009, and 2017. Data from the latest national survey on diabetes 2017 were obtained and analyzed. In the original study, a multi-stage sampling technique 
was used to select a nationally representative sample for adults from Jordan of uh, from the population of Jordan. The overall response was 78 percent, and trained interviewers administered a comprehensive structure questionnaire specifically prepared for the purpose of the study. Height, weight, waist, and hip circumferences and blood pressure were measured in a standard way. Blood samples were drawn, centrifuged within one hour at the survey site, and transferred by separate level tubes in ice boxes to the central laboratory for biochemical measurements. Diabetes was defined as a fast plasma glucose level more than or equal 7 millimole per liter or a history of diagnostic of diabetes or receiving hypoglycemic agents. HbA1c was reporting using different cutoff points. This study included a total of 1,193 males and 2,863 females. Their age ranged from 18 to 90 years, with mean 44 years. Overall, the crude prevalence was 22%. Overall, 22% of participants had diabetes, and the age-adjusted prevalence was 24%. Males had significantly higher prevalence rate than females. Of those with diabetes, 85% were aware of diabetes. This means 15% of patients with diabetes were newly diagnosed. And this slide shows that in both six, the prevalence of diabetes increased with increasing age, with almost half of patients older than 60 years were found to have diabetes. Control of diabetes was assessed using different hemoglobin A1C cutoff values. Almost one quarter of patients with diabetes had hemoglobin A1C less than 6.5% and one-third had hemoglobin A1C less than 7%. This reflecting a poor glycemic control in a significant proportion of patients. The age standardized prevalence increasing significantly between the years 1994 and 2017 comparing the age standardized prevalence rate of diabetes in 1994 and 2017, it increased significantly by 11%. In hypertension, the crude deliverance of hypertension was 41 among men and 28% among women. The age standardized prevalence was 34% among men and 29% among women. Of those with hypertension, 58% of men and two thirds, almost two thirds of women were aware of their hypertension. Almost one third of patients on antihypertensive medications had their blood pressure controlled. Between 1994 and 2017, the age standardized prevalence increased by significantly by 4%. Almost 45% of participants had elevated cholesterol level with no sex differences. About half of males and one third of females had elevated triglyceride levels with significant sex differences. Hypercholesteremia and hypertriglyceridemia in Jordan almost doubled between the 1994 and 2017.
almost three quarter of participants had low HDL level with no sex differences and about half of males and one quarter of females had high LDL levels with sex differences, with significantly sex differences. In conclusion, the prevalence rate of diabetes, hypertension, and lipid abnormalities were considerably high, increasing, and, uh, and they are poorly controlled. My recommendation is health promotion and population-based prevention, strengthen and reorientation of health systems, and improvement of disease prevention and management. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Asaf. Um, yes, Baping. Uh, yeah, I was really uh, uh, astonished by the uh, increase in the diabetes rate uh, over about 20-year period. Um, what's the reason for that? It's really uh, like doubled, uh, so it's really incredible. Increasing uh, diabetes prevalence among men. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is reflecting the, uh, the lifestyles in, in Jordan. Uh, men are so busy, and the women is uh, it's staying in houses uh, for a long time. The men, uh, the men in the works have uh, a lot of uh, food, which rich in uh, uh, bit, uh, high uh, calories intake and uh, fatty, and uh, they are. Uh, stress of the work it's uh, one of the reasons again uh, just uh, this is the reason the main reason for this so these risk factors are increasing over time uh, sure yes it's wow. increasing by time yeah and not stubble yeah thank you a thank big you. challenge okay. David Sugarman, I'm the resident advisor in Ethiopia. Very nice presentation showing alarming trends. My question was about hypertension control. It was nice to see that many of these patients were placed on medication, so it's not an access issue, but very few of them were controlled. Is that an adherence problem or mismanagement and not using the appropriate classes of medicine? And I'm not sure if your study yes, caught thank that information. You. Uh, I think the problem uh, it's uh, have a good uh, a lot of reasons. One of uh, the reasons in the public uh, health system, there is uh, they are constricted in uh, a little of choices in drug, and the education of people in Jordan about treatment they 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 didn't admit it for the treatment, and uh, they are. They didn't take uh, their medicines, uh, their medications uh, regularly. Okay. Thank you. Yes. This is Rajesh Yadav from India FTP program. So very nice presentation. Uh, I have a suggestion and a question. Like you have showed the control rates among treated, but if, for a public health point of view, it will be really nice if you can show the control rates among the hypertensives if you have completed, and it's easy to compare and it gives really uh, good information. Thank you. Yes. They cannot show uh, the others for controls. So you have shown the control rates um, among the treated, right? Yes. Thirty percent among the treated had control hypertension. From public health point of view, it's uh, uh, it's better if we show among the total hypertensive how many have control blood pressure. So did you calculate that? Thank you. I don't think you can do that. I think it's a very good question. I think we'll verify whether the I data were available to do this. I think this is discussed mm. uh, with my team. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. One more question. Uh, hi, Crystal Zang from 
uh, Tulane University. I was just curious, um, I noticed you had roughly 1,000 men and almost 3,000 women, so it's three times more number of women. Could you comment on why that discrepancy exists? Uh, uh, I say that the males uh, in work and females in Jordan uh, didn't work, uh, stay in the home. Uh, the, the, the participant females, they, they uh, go to the health centers and uh, get to, uh, they are interested about uh, investigation for their uh, diabetes and hypertension and limits. The men are uh, not interested and they didn't have time for this. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> On that cheerful note, um, let's give another <laughs> hand of <laughs> The last presentation of the night is from Dr. Akhilesha Singh from India on the risk factors of meliodosis in Udupi district. Kanataka, India, January to July 2018. Dr. Singh. Very good evening. I am going to talk about the investigation of meliodosis disease, an unrecognized public health problem in India with limited index of clinical suspicion and diagnostic challenges. Investigation started with the death of a 17-year-old boy reported from a health facility to Health Department of UDP District in Karnataka State due to neuromelodosis, an extremely rare presentation affecting the brain stem. Slide, next slide. The boy had an abrasion on his leg while playing in the neighborhood on June 28, 2018. He did not seek any treatment for it. Around the same time, his neighborhood was flooded with water due to heavy monsoon in Udupi. Nine days after the injury on July 7, the boy complained of fever. The illness progressed rapidly and he developed facial palsy on July 10. His family took him to a private practitioner for the treatment. Despite symptomatic treatment, he started having seizure on July 11. No common etiology for meningoencephalitis were identified on investigation after several lab tests. On July 14, he developed altered sensorium following which he was shifted to intensive care unit of a tertiary care hospital. On July 18, case diagnosed as a neuromelodosis uh, and, uh, from a repeat CSF sample grown for 72 hours. Samples were negative for listeriosis and other etiologies of bacterial meningitis. On July 21, the boy dies. Now I will talk briefly about the epidemiological trait of meliodosis disease. Meliodosis is caused by Burkholderia pseudomyelii, a saprophytic bacteria found in water and soil. It affects human and some animals. It is not a true zoonosis. Routes of transmission are percutaneous inoculation, aerosol inhalation, and ingestion. The median incubation period is nine days, ranging from two to 21 days. It can also extend to years and decades. Meliodosis shows wide clinical spectrum of illness. Most cases are asymptomatic. Clinical forms are acute pulmonary infection, focal infection of a skin, bone, soft tissue, fever of unknown origin, and septicemia. Neurological presentation is very rare. Diabetes mellitus chronic alcoholism, chronic kidney disease, and chronic liver disease are some three of the predisposing condition. Case fatality rate is up to 50% in endemic region, but if untreated, it can go up to 90%. Globally, there are estimated 165,000 cases annually, of which 44% are in Southeast Asia region. In India, the burden of cases and, cases and deaths are not known. It is not a reportable disease. There is low index of suspicion for the disease among the clinician due to lack of awareness and diagnostic expertise for identi identification are also no, uh, limited. Meldosis is important in Indian context as for every 12 adult Indians, one is 
diabetic, a major predisposing risk factor for maladosis. India has a low coastal belt prone to extreme weather events favorable for transmission of bulk hold area to the Malai. Now coming back to timeline event, on July 24, after getting information of death report, District Surveillance Unit in initiated investigation, and on 1st of August, India Epidemic Intelligence Service officers joined investigation. Our objectives were to describe epidemiology, determine risk factor, and to provide recommendation for control and prevention. A case was defined as resident of UDP admitted in the tertiary care hospital of, uh, from any time from January 2013 to July 2018 and diagnosed for maldosis and diagnosed for maldosis uh, by culture. We collected list of cases by reviewing of record and, and, and analyzed time, place and person data. In descriptive epidemiology, we identified 50 cases from January 13 to July 18 in UDP district with median age of 52 years with 80% male, median duration of hospitalization was 14 days ranging from 1 to 64 days and there were 8 deaths with 16% of case fatality rate. This slide shows ge geographical distribution of cases in UDP district. Black dots are cases and red dot is the only tertiary health facility with maldosis diagnostic capability in the district. More than 70% cases were clustered along the coastal line. In this slide, monthly distribution of average maldosis cases in six years and its three monthly moving average is showing. And here we can see 66% cases in the rainy season from May to September. We did a 1 is to 3 gender and diabetes match case control study to identify risk factor. A case was defined as resident of UDP admitted in the intensive care unit of hospital any time during January 17 to July 18 and diagnosed for maldosis by culture. A control was defined as resident of UDP admitted to hospital any time during July 2018 for non-infectious condition. We collected data for exposure reported three months prior to hospital admission. We collected data on clinical features and comorbidities through hospital record review of cases. We collected information on social demographic and environmental exposure, both from cases and control through face-to-face -face interview. We calculated frequencies and proportion, unadjusted and adjusted conditional odd ratio with 95% confidence in interval using STATA 15. Of 19 cases identified uh, uh, for case control study, 15 had uncontrolled diabetes. Six cases had more than one comorbidity. Of 19 cases, fever had 89%, followed by cough 42%, joint pain 37%, and in only one case, there was altered sensorium. In risk factor analysis, we identified 19 cases and 57 control. Odds of exposure, odds of exposure to injury with breach of skin was higher among cases than among control. Odds of exposure to contact with soil, odds of exposure uh, contact with stagnant water, and odds of exposure to both contact water and soil were associated with the illness. We also looked at activity specific odd ratio for these three type of contacts. Odds of exposure to swimming in dirty water, paddy field work, walk in waterlogged area, and gardening were higher among cases than among control. In multivariate analysis, two exposure, contact with soil and stagnant water continue to be significantly associated with the illness. Our study had a few limitations. There is recall bias for exposure due to retrospective nature of the study design. We tried to limit this by enrolling the most recent cases and asking for exposure from cases and control within a three months of reference period. The enrollment period for cases and control was different due to logistical issues. 
but we try to ensure comparability of exposure by enrolling control during the rainy season, a time of high risk. Only severe cases from a single hospital were enrolled, so findings about the disease cannot be generalized. In conclusion, this investigation was triggered by death of a boy due to rare neuromelidosis. We found severe melidosis mostly in the rainy season and disproportionately affected adult diabetic male presenting with fever of unknown etiology and is possibly associated with the routine exposure to stagnant water and soil. Next slide. We recommended targeted communication among high-risk groups such as diabetics in coastal areas to avoid contact of open wound with the soil and water. Share finding with agriculture department to promote use of protective clothing for farm work in coastal areas. Educate medical doctor for early diagnosis and treatment of fever of unknown origin cases as melidosis. Strengthen district public health lab in Karnataka state for melidosis diagnosis. Following this investigation, National Center for Disease Control formulated information related to increase awareness among clinicians to consider melidosis as differential diagnosis in case of fever and pneumonia of unknown origin. The, to enhance surveillance, we conducted an expert group meeting and developed surveillance case definition for the state. We initiated training of district lab personnel for melidosis diagnosis. Thanks to all who supported and guided. Thank you. Thank you very much. Vicky. Hi, I'm from FETP Philippines. Congratulations on such great work and an excellent presentation. I'm interested about the profile of those who died. Can you share some of the profile of those who died? Uh, Actually, uh, here we are not showing anything. What would you like to know in that that case? I wonder if they have co comorbidities and um, other demographics that could have um, uh, added to it. Uh, right now, we are having uh, 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 this analysis of 19 cases for 17 and 18. Total, there was eight deaths. Total, there were eight deaths, and uh, all uh, around eight, uh, total, there was total eight deaths. Seven deaths were in 17 and 18. There was one death in that 2015. And uh, right now, we don't have that data. All those deaths were associated with the, out of seven, five were having diabetes. And other comorbidities not known, but diabetes was present in the five cases out of seven in 2019. 17 and 18 data, there were seven deaths, and out of seven deaths, there were five cases who were having diabetes. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, hi, Dr. Priya Khan. Um, yeah. Good presentations, Dr. Akleshwar. Uh, I have one question. Historically, melidiosis presented with a uh, communal, uh, mostly communal water supply and sort of post uh, typhoon or, or, or flood. So the key is whether you have done an environmental surveillance or not. So I couldn't see that in your presentations. Can you just uh, uh, update us whether uh, the environmental surveillance has been done now as an uh, EIS officer being employed there? or initially being a, a part of this Udupi district, they have done it regularly? Uh, as far as uh, environmental surveillance, uh, this surveillance is being done by the KMC Manipal. And they are uh, trying to uh, identify the isolate from that environmental samples. But uh, in that case, where we have gone for investigation, they have also done for environmental, uh, they have also taken for environmental sample, but uh, uh, couldn't uh, find, not find anything. As a part of your investigation, have you done any environmental no, no, surveillance? No, no, it was not a part of our investigation. Right, thank you. Yes. 
Uh, Eric Hebsner, CDC. So to your recommendations about strengthening lab capacity for diagnosis and also about increasing surveillance, I'm wondering if you have some reason to believe that there's major, um, you're not picking up cases or missing a lot of cases. Is, is that the case? I didn't see that in your presentation. Can you repeat again? So you have two recommendations, strengthening lab capacity for diagnosis yeah. and then also a recommendation about strengthening surveillance. Are you believing that you're missing a lot of cases of this disease? The cases which we are reporting, the cases which we are detecting, it, it's a just a, 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 all the cases are being reported only from a one center. And uh, there are, and these are those cases who are hospitalized cases. There are some cases who are not so severe to, might be that those cases are not coming to hospital. So detecting all those cases, there is a need of surveillance system, establishment of surveillance system. And uh, because of because of the diagnostic uh, challenges, there is a need of expertise for there is a need of expertise for laboratory personnel to identify that uh, particular bacteria. Yes, Kip. <clears throat> Thank you for the presentation. Very interesting. Um, Melioidosis is well described in in northern northeast Thailand and northern Australia. Um, but I think very under-recognized in a lot of other places. You described a case fatality rate of about 16%, um, which to me, from my experience, is actually on the low side, to which suggests that that tertiary care center where your cases came from actually had some experience with, with managing melioidosis, which is, requires different antibiotics than some routine infections. Um, so I'm wondering, do you believe that case fatality rate is on the low side? Are there, like outside of your hospital, the case hospital, mm -hmm. do you believe that there are a lot of missed cases that may be dying because they're under-recognized and, and not treated appropriately? Definitely, it, it might be possible because there is only one center in the whole, in that whole uh, district. And that is capturing all the cases. It might be possible the cases far away from the, that center is not coming to uh, that hospital. And uh, the data we analyzed in, uh, in case control study, 17 and 18, it found to be 37% mortality. If we compare from 16, uh, 13 to 18, it is, it is just 16%. But if we compare from 17 to 18 data, 17 and 18 data, which we did in case control study, it is. It came out to be 37 percent, and and this data is just only from a one center, from uh, all over around area. The cases are coming to only that center, so it might be possible the cases are uh, missing and the exact mortality we are not uh, uh, knowing in that area. Thank you. Thanks for um, sharing with us about melioidosis in your setting. I've got a methods question. Um, I noticed that you're using hospital-based controls, and I wondered how might your study have been different if you had used uh, community controls, perhaps matching on residents or village, uh, maybe not. And what were the advantages or disadvantages of using the hospital patients for your control group? Thank you. Uh, actually, this is our limitations. This is a basically our limitation of study. This is a limitation key. Uh, we enrolled the control from the hospital because logistically it was not feasible, no, not feasible to take controls from the community. So we took the uh, controls from the hospital, and it is, it is our lim limitation. But we tried to compensate by uh, this shortcoming by by taking uh, exposure period in the rainy season. That is a high risk season. We took the exposure period. We took the exposure period of that exposure period, which is a high risk period. So we compensated by this shortcoming by uh, taking data from that high risk period. Can I ask just one more follow up on yeah. that, that topic? When you say you took it from the high risk period, I thought I noticed that the controls were taken only from one month, from yeah, July, but the cases were from a six-month period. Logistically, it was not possible, ma'am, to, to enroll in that period. Okay. So 
we try to compensate by uh, enrolling cases in the high re high risk season. That is July is the rainy season, that's and the, the maximum cases are occurring in that in particular that period. In okay. that particular period. That was my question. So that mm -hmm. the exposure in the cases and control remains almost mm -hmm. same. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. For thank you. Thank you. We've come to the end of the presentation. Um, say more? Yes. So we've come to the end of the presentations. I'm Seymour Williams. I'm the field epidemiology training program team lead here at headquarters, and it's really my privilege to just watch the diversity of the presentations. I've just been sitting there and just getting energized by this. I know it's late, and we're going to move through the next part swiftly. So yesterday we had the posters. Now we're going to do the participation for the oral session and then announce the awards. So I'm going to build some anticipation as we get through this. <laughs> so first, let's thank Dr. Bunnell and Dr. Shibanga for the good work they did moderating the session. So I would like all the oral and poster presenters to stand. Take a deep breath. Hold on in the applause. It's over now, OK? <laughs> Breathe. Okay. Turn to the audience, turn around, let them see you, and let's give them a round of applause. Take another deep breath and you may have a seat. Doctors Red and Dr. Ijaz, would you mind joining us, please? And also, Dr. O'Carroll and Dr. Baggett. Just for reference for our colleagues internationally, we're going to also be giving certificates to, of participation for those uh, residents who had um, accepted posters and orals but weren't able to attend. And I think that's Uganda, India, Cameroon, and Yemen. Okay. So let's begin the certificates of participation for the orals. When I call your name, presenters, please stand, come up, and you'll get the handshakes from our seniors here. So each will go up, receive your certification, you'll shake hands, you'll take photos, and then I'll call the next one. So for the orals, Yunang Chue from Taiwan. Very good. Kabala Gulecha from Kenya. Anthea Catalaris, Australia. Irene Mukurasi Kokuvawa.
Saeed Asaf of Jordan. Akil Shawar Singh of India. And for the daytime presenters, we had Aideen Marquis of Germany. And then Saeed gets to come back because he also did the daytime. <laughs> All right. So gentlemen, don't move. We we have the photo contest and they were in two categories. We had a photo for the Facebook winner and then for the other um, photos. So the Facebook winner, we had over 2,000 people vote on this, is the submission from Egypt. Shima Abdallah Gebeli from Egypt. This photo was taken at a primary health care center while training community workers on an event-based surveillance. They were instructed and con collecting information on how to report events that threaten public health and what events should be reported. The photo was taken in January of 2018 in El Merck's district, Fayoun, Egypt. Can someone from Enfinet, if there's no one from Egypt here, uh, receive on their behalf? Mohan. Yes. <laughs> so the photos were judged by a panel, whereas the Facebook poster was a picture was judged by votes. So if you voted online, you know, you can force the vote, but the panel was they were very precise. So the third place for our, our photo was by Sanam Hussein in Pakistan, third place. So can the resident advisor from Pakistan come to accept? So Dr. Sanam Hussein is an FELTP alumnus who while collecting data through active search of cases during a chikungunya outbreak investigation at a village of a village of District Thar Prakur in Sindh, Pakistan, August 10, 2017. So the second place winner was from Indonesia. Kizni Awati Rayawu of Indonesia is the second place winner. An FETP trainee was conducting a door-to-door -door interview to collect data during a foodborne disease outbreak that was caused by donated iftar food in Gunung Kikul district, Indonesia. Can the resident advisor accept on their behalf someone from Indonesia? Okay, no, someone come.
So drum roll. The first place winner of the photo contest is from Nigeria. <laughs> Tamuno Wari Numberi. So this picture was taken in Asang, Asang Beni, a hard to reach riverine community in Yanagawa local government area by Elsa State, Nigeria in April 2018. They were administering the oral polio vaccine to a child while supported by the mother as part of the activities during the April 28th round of national immunization, immunization plus days. So our next award is the Jeffrey P. Copeland Award for Excellence in Poster Scientific Presentation. The Jeffrey P. Copeland Award for Excellence in Scientific Poster was established back in 2014 in honor of Dr. Jeff Copeland. He's a former director of CDC and a 26-year veteran serving at CDC, and he really had a lot of outstanding contributions that improved public health globally, and he was committed to excellence in scientific research, analysis, and presentation. The award is presented to the winner of the scientific poster presentation that most effectively emphasizes the results of an investigation and its impact on public health. The winner of this year's award is Muniza Fatima of Pakistan for a scientific poster presentation. Moniza presented her poster on complications associated with extremely drug-resistant typhoid fever cases in hospitalized patients of District Hyderabad, Pakistan, 2017 to 2018. The moment you've been waiting for. Our final award this evening, and the one that we've all been waiting for, is the William Fagey Award for Excellence in Oral Scientific Presentation. The Bill Fagey Award for Excellence in Scientific Oral Presentation was established in honor of Dr. Bill Fagey. He was a renowned epidemiologist, Presidential Medal of Freedom recipient, and he's a former director of the US CDC. He was credited with working with colleagues in devising a global strategy that led to the eradication of smallpox in the late 1970s. The award is the highest FETP International Night Honor and is presented to the best oral presentation. Drum roll. <laughs> the winner for this year's award, Fagi Award, is Irene Mukurasi Kokomboa <laughs> of Tanzania. So you heard her talk. She presented on linkage into care among newly diagnosed HIV-infected individuals in Yombe region, Tanzania. She handled the questions professionally, and I think she really has um, got good support from her resident advisor and people here. At, I, I saw the, the, it was great. <laughs> so we're, wow, on time. So I would like to invite um, the, all the poster presenters for, uh, to stay in the auditorium. I'm going to invite up Dr. Kip Baggett to uh, do the closing comments, but we need people to stay in the, the room because we're going to do some photos with uh, our panelists.
with the moderators so you can photo document what we have done tonight. <laughs> okay, thank you, Seymour. Um, I know it's late, so I'll, I'll be brief. Um, so let me let me start by by thanking a few people. Um, thank our co-moderators again for doing such a, a wonderful job, uh, Dr. Bunnell, Dr. Bunnell, and Professor Chimanga. Thank you very much for your excellent moderation and keeping us really exactly on time. It was quite impressive. I want to thank Admiral Red, Dr. Ajaz, and Dr. O'Carroll for their comments and active participation tonight. Thank you so much. Um, and I've been involved in, in several international nights over the past few years, and I honestly feel like um, tonight and last night have, have really been special. They've been great, some of the best that I've been involved in. And so I, I really want to take a second to, to thank the planning committee. And I'm going to ask you to stand up, please, because I, I don't want to take too long to say everybody's name. But please stand up if you're on the planning committee. Come on, Tina, Amber, Cindy, Lee. Really, these people have done an amazing job behind the scenes to pull this off. It really is, has been fantastic. Um, and of course, I want to congratulate all of the presenters, both oral and poster presenters. Um, some really fantastic presentations last night and tonight. We had incredible diversity in the topics covered, HIV, TB, malaria, antimicrobial resistance, chronic diseases, influenza, cholera, vaccine-preventable diseases, maternal child health. It was just an array of topics. We had representation from all around the world, all continents represented, not Antarctica, but all the other continents represented, all WHO regions of the world represented. And tonight, we even had perfect gender balance, I noticed. So it was really, really well done. Um, great job, presenters, really amazing. Um, and those of you who reviewed abstracts, um, your work is critical for this. So I want to thank all of you for taking the time to review abstracts. And I did it this year, and it's really a great experience. So those of you who didn't do it and are interested, please take the opportunity to do it at a future conference. It's really great. And um, Seymour is reminding me also to thank the judges um, is that safe to do? There might be some people who are upset with their results. <laughs> <laughs> David Sugarman, Seymour Williams, Diana Benzel, uh, thank you for judging. I think you were the uh, oral judges. And Raina Tercios, Michael Kinzer, and My Marta Guerra, thank you very much for your time to <laughs> judge. So the events uh, last night and tonight remind us of the importance of the work that we do to build, to promote, and to recognize scientific excellence. The EIS conference this week and international nights tonight and last night offer us a forum to highlight this science and to demonstrate another critical competency of field epidemiology training, and that's effective scientific communication. And I think we've seen that on display last night and tonight. Um, and as important as the science is and as important as the, the presentation of that science is, um, we want to also remember what is behind it all and the purpose of it all, and, and that is service. And Dr. Frieden reminded us of that tonight in his comments, that field, epidemi field epidemiology training is at its core a service program. And so the science is there so that we can develop action-oriented recommendations uh, to make a public health difference, to make public health impact. So and I think we've also seen that on display tonight. And I hope that is the message that will carry you through through this next year as you return to your programs, uh, continue to carry out those recommendations to have public health impact, to save lives, and strengthen global health security. So one uh, last comment and one last thank you, and that's to all of you. Um, I am quite impressed with the participation and those who have stayed through the entirety of the, of the night. I know it's a long night, 
Um, but thank you so much for being here. And this year we did something a little bit different. You all should have registered when you came in either last night or tonight. And with that registration, as you might imagine, you're going to receive a short, very short survey at some point in the near future from TEFINET to tell us your thoughts about International Night last night and tonight. And please, please, I know you get a lot of these, but please take the time to give us your feedback because we want to do even better next year. And we will use your feedback. Next year is the 20th anniversary of International Night. So we will take your feedback and we're going to put on something even more special next year. So thank you and have a good night. And remember, poster and oral presenters, please stay for photos. Thank you.